Hello everyone, this is Darion of GMB Productions, and today we are going to be taking a look at Devil May Cry 5, 5 years later. Devil May Cry 5 released 5 years ago in March of 2019. The game focuses on veteran devil hunters Dante and Nero, along with a mysterious newcomer who goes by the name V, all needing to band together to defeat an all-powerful demon called Urizen and his conquest for power, as well as put an end to a long-brewing rivalry. Devil May Cry 5 marked a long way to return to the popular hack-and-slash franchise. By the time this game was announced in 2018, I had only gotten into the franchise at least two or maybe three years prior. I was aware of the series in 2013 because of the reboot, but didn't get the chance to play any of the games up until 2015 or 16, I believe. Basically, whenever they became available on PlayStation Now is when I got the chance to play them. Remember when PS Now was a thing? That shit fucking sucked. I was playing Sonic Unleashed on there, and it always crashed on me in the middle of me playing Eggman Land. Still beat that shit, though. Anyway, so needless to say, I chose the perfect time to jump on the bandwagon and was unbelievably excited for the newest installment. I already know this video was going to miss the anniversary mark by at least a month, but regardless, there's no way I could pass up the opportunity to gush about this game. I'm being so serious when I say this game may not only be my favorite in the series, but might also be in my top 5 favorite video games ever. It's been 5 whole years since the return of this iconic devil hunting pack, and I'd like to go over how well it's held up since release. The first thing that needs to be brought up is this game's art style and direction. Firstly, graphically, the game obviously looks absolutely stunning. A small part of me is disappointed that we didn't continue with the art style of 4 because I just think that's the perfect evolution of the DMC look, but regardless, the work done with the RE engine for this game looks absolutely incredible. Something I do have a few grievances about is the art direction for this game, however. This is probably just a me thing, but I really miss the gothic horror atmosphere that was given in the first and third game of the series. To me, that just screams Devil May Cry, and whenever games like 2, 4, and even this game steps away from that, it just feels bland. Don't get me wrong, it's not terrible, just kinda... basic. A good portion of the game's levels take place in the clearly London-inspired Redgrave City, and whenever we're not running through there, we're venturing through the treacherous demonic Clyfop tree, where all the demonic landscapes really blend together with little to no variety. Again, it's not terrible, but it does leave a lot to be desired. Presentation-wise, this game is also a far cry above the rest. Gone are the days of having fixed camera angles that change depending on where you go in the level, and gone are the days of having unnecessarily complicated level progression. In favor of those, we have a camera that is primarily behind the player, and that we can actually control. And the levels are a bit more straightforward, which allows for far less confusion when it comes to progressing them. Again, this is more than likely just a me thing, but I'm very glad they decided to make these changes for the fifth game, as it just makes things less complicated. They even added in a feature that helps you see where you need to go in case you do get lost. And I don't know, I just find it kind of neat. Stylish combat is the absolute heart and soul of Devil May Cry, and after 11 years, not counting the reboot, of an absence from the series, you almost gotta wonder, is DMC still gonna be able to maintain its spot as one of the pinnacle of hack and slash action? What are you fucking stupid? Of course it is. The combat in this game is not only amazing, but is genuinely the best it's ever been for a DMC game. Not only is it a great return to form for the series, but it's also generally just been pretty greatly elevated as well. Each character, while similar to an extent, all feel greatly unique with their own quirks and playstyles. As I alluded to in the beginning of the video, we have three, yep, three playable characters, no more than three, Dante, Nero, and the mysterious V. First, let's start off with Nero. Without going into story details just yet, Nero for the duration of this game is left without his handy Devil Bringer and has opted to use these mechanical devil arms called Devil Breakers built for him by his associate and new character Nico Goldstein. Now while he still has his trusty sword Red Queen and Gun Blue Rose which operate about the same as they did in DMC4, the decision to immediately remove Nero's primary... gimmick, I should say? I don't even think that's the right word to call it in the following game was a strange but very welcome decision in my opinion, because it just allows for Nero's moveset to feel a bit more unique and versatile. The Devil Breaker's main function is essentially the same as the various weapons you acquire throughout any DMC game, except the kicker here is that getting attacked while using it, or attempting to switch and use another one results in it breaking. This system has been a pretty controversial one since release. 
People since the game's release have had a grievance with not being able to switch freely between breakers, but I honestly love this mechanic for a multitude of reasons. The first and most obvious one being that if we were able to freely switch between breakers, that would just further cement Nero as nothing more than a Dante clone. Having to work with what you've got and not be able to switch him out is just so much more interesting to me. Also, I love how you actually get punished for playing badly by having them break if you're attacked while using them. Devil May Cry as a series is so good at just encouraging the player to play as cool as possible in the simplest of ways. Having your limited number of weapons deplete from you either being too reckless or not paying enough attention is so much fun to me. Going even further with what I said about having to work with what you've got, if you're a basic bitch like me who likely only chooses a variety of Devil Breakers like the Electric Overture or the Rocket Punch Punch line, the game does offer custom rosters to make things super interesting. But never fear, you're not free from some Devil Bringer goodness, not only with the Buster Devil Breaker, a replica of Nero's Devil Bringer, which becomes extremely irrelevant within this next sentence. Without going into story details, you do get his actual Devil Bringer back, which along with the versatile Devil Breakers, combined with the intense and ferocity of the Buster moves, makes for a pretty fun playstyle. To go briefly over the Devil Breakers, we have Overture as the main and default Devil Breaker. As a default, it's simple but pretty cool. The main function is basically an electric punch. Simple, but pretty cool. Something of note is that each Devil Breaker has a special move that once activated results in it, you guessed it, breaking. Overture's special move basically turns it into a landmine that allows you to get some sick combos in before it goes off, or you can remotely detonate it by shooting it. Next up is Gerbera, or Gerbera, fuck, I have no idea which is which, which to me is kinda lame. Well, it's only lame from a combat standpoint, as being able to bounce around enemies freely is pretty fun, but in comparison to the other ones, it just feels the most underwhelming. Helter Skelter works really well for close encounters and breaks shields and armored enemies better than others. Tomboy is one that has a pretty big learning curve that I haven't gotten the hang of yet. It basically upgrades the Red Queen and Blue Rose to shoot and attack harder. The swings are a lot heavier and the shots are more precise, which leaves more room to get attacked and it to break. Buster Arm is basically the Devil Bringer, which, as I said before, becomes useless after the main game. Rawhide creates a fury of whips that can latch onto enemies, which is pretty cool. Ragtime is really cool and allows you to stop time around enemies, and its special move allows you to stop it completely for a period. Needless to say, pretty damn cool. There are also a few DLC breakers that I haven't gotten, but still feel the need to bring up. One is literally just Mega Man's Blaster, which is cool. Pasta Breaker, which, I'ma be honest, I have no clue what it actually even does. And Sweet Surrender, whose sole existence confirms that Nero, yeah, he's packing. Anyway, Nero overall is a fucking blast to use. The Exceed on Red Queen is so much more satisfying to pull off than how it was in 4. The Devil Breakers are a fun and unique addition to his playstyle, and while players of the previous games will feel the absence of his Devil Bringer and even his Devil Trigger, by the end of the game, when they're both implemented, it all works brilliantly together. Nero is just so much fun. Now onto the mysterious newcomer, V. V functions the most differently from the traditional Devil May Cry playstyle. The way V operates is that unlike Dante and Nero, where they dive headfirst into the action in chaotic and stylish fashion, he instead sits back and lets his demon familiars, Griffin, Shadow, and Nightmare, fight for him to weaken the demons enough for him to land the final blow. When it comes to V, it is a very strong split between folks either loving or despising his gameplay style. Me, however, while I'm fond of V's playstyle, I can still safely say it is the weakest of the bunch. V feels a bit awkward to get the hang of at first because his playstyle doesn't encourage stringing combos together like Dante or Nero. Or at least not the same as them because you control Griffin and Shadow independently, and it's a bit hard to get that same kind of momentum going. That said, once you do get the hang of it, his playstyle is pretty fun, I'd say. Trying to play keep away with the familiar so that V doesn't take damage was an interesting approach. Griffin functions as your gun abilities while Shadow is your melee, and they each have their own varying upgrades and abilities. Griffin, when you're not focusing on basic blasts, thrives on charge-based attacks. Shadow being melee is more versatile in getting combos going. It's these two working in tandem that tends to create a little bit of an issue when it comes to trying to take out enemies, but also having to be aware of some that may approach and attack V. And generally, it's just hard to charge their attacks while trying to use the other at the same time. 
they even have their own health bars for you to worry about on top of that too. Even though I haven't tried it yet, maybe the best way to use V would be to customize the controls by swapping the placement on either Griffin or Shadow's controls. Again, I haven't tried this myself, but I do feel like this could be a good workaround. It's not impossible to get some good combos going with V, but it does take a bit, and once you do, it is pretty satisfying. Instead of V having a sick demon form of his own, his devil trigger is what summons the nightmare demon, and he basically operates on his own, destroying everything in his path, and yeah, it's pretty cool. You can even ride on top of him to control all three familiars at once, and it's really just a fucking blast to watch all the chaos and destruction unfold. I don't know, I just can't find myself having a lot to say about V. I like the attempt to add something unique and fresh to the series, but it really could have been executed better. He's not horrible, as I like the codependency theme with him and the familiars from a concept standpoint, but from a gameplay standpoint, while fun in some aspects, could have used just a bit more work. I don't loathe any time I have to play as him, because like I said, I still do find him fun. But since beating the game, I literally never go back to play as him. If we ever get a DMC6, I still want to encourage the devs to take another approach with offering unique playstyles like this, because it could just be really interesting, I feel. Dante. Dante, Dante, Dante. If Nero is the safe and simple entry for DMC newcomers, and V is the experimental new addition to the series, Dante literally is Devil May Cry. And what I mean by that is that Dante's playstyle is literally what this franchise is about to its core. And in DMC5, Dante, and by proxy, the series' main playstyle, is literally perfected. Dante's playstyle prioritizes stringing together these fast and chaotic combos in swift and stylish fashion. The cool new tweaks and additions given to Dante's playstyle, while minor in some cases, make enough of a difference to where he's unironically one of the best characters to play in a video game. Coming from me, that's not saying much because I don't play a lot of video games, but the point still stands. As far as weapons goes, for starters, Dante begins with his trusty guns, Ebony and Ivory, and Sword Rebellion. Along with a new addition to Dante's default roster, we have a new gauntlet-type weapon, Balrog. The game doesn't acknowledge them or tell you where Dante got them, but all of that is answered in the DMC prequel novel Before the Nightmare. Yeah, that highlights a major issue I have with this series that I'll go further into when discussing the story. Anyway, the game really doesn't need to go over it, but I think these may be my favorite gauntlet-type weapons in the series. Because with them, you can switch between punch-based attacks and kick-based attacks, and the more attacks you string together, the more they ignite and put out more damage. I found myself using more of the feet-based attacks because they're just more wild and fun, and just offer more than the punch-based ones, I feel, but more skilled players can make it all work together, I'm sure. Rebellion as well as Ebony and Ivory operate about the same as they did in the past entries, so I'll take this time to talk about Dante's newest blade weapon given to him in this game, aptly called the Devil Sword Dante. I fucking adored this weapon for so many reasons. I'll go into the story significance later, but overall, it basically functions as a more refined Rebellion and Devil Sword Sparta. A lot of the moves and techniques the previous two blades have are more simpler to pull off. They also come equipped with Dante's own variation of summon swords that work beautifully in tandem with the style system. Because I haven't talked about the other games in the series, I feel the need to briefly go over the style system of DMC. Introduced in DMC 3, the series was introduced to the Four Style System. Swordmaster, which provided additional moves and techniques for your melee weapons, Gunslinger, which did the same for your gun weapons, Trickster, which allowed for fast-paced dodge-like movements across the battlefield, and Royal Guard, a block-slash-parry type move. In the third game, you could only equip one style at a time, but when DMC4 rolled around, they evolved it to where you can switch between them on the fly. But Dante's overall gameplay in 4 was a bit meh, so it never really felt fully realized. I say all this because 5 actually properly designed Dante for these enemies and levels, and the style switching gameplay now feels fully fleshed out. Slight nitpick, I miss when Trickster allowed you to run on walls and shit, but that's besides the point. And on the topic of summon swords, they all add a new feature to the styles in battle. When in Swordmaster, the swords can add in extra attacks to your combos. The same applies to Gunslinger. For Trickster, they provide extra mobility, and in Royal Guard, they provide extra shielding. Royal Guard in general just got a big fucking buff. Being able to charge up with each block and then unleash it all back in a devastating blow is just so fucking satisfying. Anyway, they all provide such unique additions to the gameplay and are just really fun. As for the other weapons in Nante's arsenal, we of course have his Coyote A shotgun. 
which operates the same as it does in the previous games. Something I love about DMC is that when it comes to its levels and the design of them, if you take the opportunity to explore, you can be greatly rewarded with helpful items, including weapons. Because in missions 10 or 11, I believe, I think you can find the character ladies Kalina and Rocket Launcher, adding it to your arsenal. And later, when Nico gifts Dante with an upgraded one, you can dual wield them and just wreak havoc. This isn't something the game points out, but you're just greatly rewarded for going out of your way to find it. Like, how can you look at this and tell me it's not the coolest thing ever? Come on! Going further, we have the return of DMC3's Cerberus, but with a few upgrades. In this game, we are blessed with King Cerberus, which has control over the elements Ice, Fire, and Lightning. You use Fire with Swordmaster that turns the nunchucks into a cool bow staff, and you use Lightning by holding each of your attacks to let loose a cool chain lightning attack. Cerberus was already a really fun weapon to use in 3, and it was just further elevated in this game to an outstanding degree. Another weapon up Dante's sleeve is the badass Cavalier Motorcycle, which may just be my favorite weapon in any DMC game. A motorcycle that also functions as dual-wielded saw blades is the coolest thing they could have ever done, and is the most Dante weapon they could have added into this series. The last weapon in Dante's belt is the new Faust Hat. This weapon, like Nero's Tomboy Devil Breaker, has a big learning curve that I have yet to master. It's a very high-risk, high-reward kind of weapon because it uses up the game's main currency, Red Orbs. You use Red Orbs to upgrade your stats, unlock new moves, and purchase Devil Breakers in the shop. So giving us a weapon whose sole thing is spending those that which we need to improve ourselves in the game is certainly a choice. You use it by throwing the hat onto enemies, and the more damage you deal out, the more orbs you get back. But, if you yourself are damaged, you'll lose a shit ton of orbs. Like I said, high risk, high reward. It's not a bad weapon by any means, just one that I have yet to properly get the hang of. Dante's Devil Trigger operates the same as it does before. But, with the addition of Devil Sword Dante, he acquires an all-new Sin Devil Trigger. Where Dante unleashes his full demonic power and raises all hell across the battlefield. You use this by taking the energy from your regular Devil Trigger bar and fueling it in the SDT bar, and for a short time you'll be able to fly around and fuck shit up, and it's the coolest thing ever. I don't know what else to say really, Dante just kicks so much ass, man. The art of pulling off these insane combos is so fun once you master it, and it's all just been perfect in this game. A system I want to briefly mention is the taunts. Taunts in DMC are moves where you essentially make fun of the enemies you're beating the shit out of, and doing them effectively can increase your style ranking and fill up your Devil Trigger gauge faster. I say this because it's just another one of those things that just makes you feel like a badass when pulled off effectively. And the way each taunt corresponds to the specific characters is so cool. V literally reads William Blake poetry while having his minions annihilate the enemies. How is this shit not cool? The enemies in the game are all pretty damn fun. You have your basic grunt type enemies, but the others like Hell Judessa, which teleports across the battlefield and summons more enemies, Chaos, which does this death spin attack for you to watch out for, and these guys who I swear are the pride enemies from DMC3, and I gotta congratulate them on their new diet because they finally stopped bleeding sand for some reason. Also, fuck Fury by the way, that guy can suck my dick. On the topic of that, I gotta say I just love how DMC5 handles fan service. Because it's done in a subtle and tasteful way where it's not thrown in your face. You've got the Death Scissors who return from DMC1. You've got various new Angelo-type enemies as well. And these familiars, Griffin, Shadow, and Nightmare, are all literally enemies and bosses Dante fought in DMC1. I love it because it's not just forced in there. They're placed there for the longtime fans who will recognize them, and if you don't, then it ultimately won't matter. Anyway, we got the Armored Behemoth, which, once released, becomes this ravenous monster which is cool to deal with. Baphomet and the Evolved Lucichia, which have these cool magic powers which are pretty fun. The monstrous nobodies with their wild and intense strength. The enemies are just a lot of fun, really. And their designs are also just beautifully horrific as well. The bosses as well, I think, may be some of the best in the series. Now, they aren't all great. Ones like Needhog, the Clyphoth roots you fight in the beginning are kinda lame. But ones like Malphus, the King Cerberus fight, Goliath, all kicked ass. And don't get me started on the final fights with Virgil. Character battles in this franchise since 3 have continued to be undefeated for me, and the fights with Virgil are literal perfection. 
The combat, enemies, and bosses alone here makes DMC5 a top-tier action game in my eyes. The music in this game? Oh, sweet lord, the music. The music in DMC is something I've always been fond of. I don't think the overall soundtracks of the past games are groundbreaking or noteworthy, but they're still really good and serviceable for each title. I cannot, however, say the same for DMC5, because unironically, the music in this game is some of the best music I've ever heard from a video game. I play a shit ton of Sonic games, so I think I have a pretty good stance on what good video game music sounds like. Each character has an exclusive battle theme that attributes to their story, and this is another thing I find fascinating with DMC, because with the music, it's another thing that encourages the player to better themselves. You see, when you're in the middle of combat, a style meter will appear, and the better you play, the more the style meter will go up. The thing that's fascinating about DMC, however, is the character's battle theme will play while you're fighting, and the more your style rank goes up, the more the music will pick up, which encourages you to keep going and get the highest possible score so you can properly rock out while kicking demon ass. This is what I mean when I say they find the most interesting ways to encourage the player to play as cool as possible. I love this series so damn much. To go over each character theme specifically, Nero's main theme, and by proxy the main theme of the whole game, is Devil Trigger by Casey and Allie Edwards. This song just speaks to me on a personal level, to a scary degree, and it just perfectly fits Nero's brash and intense nature. V's theme, Crimson Cloud, isn't as good in my opinion, but it still kicks ass and makes for a cool battle theme once it ramps up. Dante's theme, Subhuman, is kinda dog shit. Okay, I'm exaggerating a tad, but I'm just really not too fond of this one. I am a slight fan of death metal kind of music, or at least music adjacent to that, so this should have been a hit for me, but I just can't get into it. It also just doesn't really fit Dante's character, not to mention the name of the song and some of the lyrics don't make that much sense. Last I checked, subhuman meant below or beneath human. So is it meant to be literal, in that Dante is half demon, and the demon world is below the human world? Is that the symbolism? I don't know, either way, I'm not that big a fan. I highly recommend YouTuber Little V's cover of the song, however. That's really the only version I find myself enjoying, it's great. The music overall just kicks ass, and it doesn't stop at the battle themes. The song Legacy by Kota Suzuki and Ali Edwards is just fucking beautiful. And Silver Bullet, the song that plays during the final Virgil fight, just goes so damn hard. You know when the final boss music is a remixed version of the main theme, you are in for some shit. The music in DMC5 is the best this franchise has to offer, I'm not even kidding. Now let's get into the story of DMC5. The story of the Devil May Cry franchise, while not some of the best writing out there, none of this shit is Shakespeare level or anything like that, regardless, it's still a touching story about family, family trauma, a legacy, and DMC5 runs all the way with it, making it the most focused and introspective narrative in the franchise. 
Even though we haven't been in this world for well over a decade, this all feels like a natural conclusion to the story that has been pathed from DMC 1 to 4. To start things off, I want to talk about the story structure. The story of this game is primarily told in a non-linear format, with you as the player bouncing around from the different points in time and between different characters and such. That really was the best way they could have gone about this narrative, because it gives a lot of room for the characters and plot to breathe and flow naturally. The story has to juggle a lot of characters and plot points, and it does so, for the most part, surprisingly well. The tone of this game is where I think DMC is pretty much perfected. When it comes to its tone, DMC has always been a bit of a goofy, fun series. Even in the first game, where you can argue things were meant to be played a bit more straight, they still had a lot of unintentionally hilarious scenes and dialogue. When 3 rolled around, they found a good balance with the fun, wacky, over-the-top BS, along with an emotional narrative which I've expressed before on the channel takes a lot of skill to pull off. This story is just chopped full of the most unnecessarily goofy and batshit insane moments that I can't get enough of. It's not perfect, however, because given the structure of the game being only about 20 playable missions, some things tend to get rushed, especially towards the end. I'm always torn between whether I like the story of DMC3 or this game more. Because I will say, with how much this game's story attempts to go over, some stuff doesn't get the chance to be further fleshed out whereas DMC 3's story is much more simple and consistent by comparison. Anyway, enough beating around the bush, let's get into the characters. The heart and soul of Devil May Cry. Say what you will about the narrative itself, but the highlight of these stories will always be its amazing cast of characters. The character interactions and drama is what single-handedly carries the stories of these games, at least to me personally. Let's start things off with Nero, who got a much-deserved redemption after DMC 4. When I first ran through DMC4, I thought Nero was a... fine protagonist. Nothing about him was really noteworthy to me. His story throughout the game wasn't all that engaging, and the overall character just left a lot to be desired. It's insane how just one game can make me go from feeling complete indifference to absolutely loving him. His story throughout this game is genuinely amazing. The vendetta he has towards Urizen for stealing his arm at the beginning and the drive to prove how powerful he is because of Dante was executed fairly well. I know people meme on the whole dead weight thing, myself included, but when looking at it from the broad point of view with Nero being this punk kid who didn't really grow up feeling like he belonged, and the closest thing he has to a mentor figure dropping that on him, it kind of makes sense why he'd take it to the extent that he did, and it honestly made for a compelling driving force for him throughout the story. But it's when Nero gets the news that the guy who took his arm and has been fighting this whole time ultimately is his very own father, where Nero's journey became some of the most beautiful stories told in gaming, I'm not even joking. After getting the pretty understandably mind-shattering news that his dad is this diabolical piece of shit, and now he suddenly has an uncle, he goes and has a talk with his girlfriend Kyrie, who somehow is more useful the less she's on screen. Anyway, he ultimately comes to the conclusion to use his power to protect what little family he has. My only gripe about this scene is that Nero brings up Kratos, Kirie's brother from DMC4, but it just kind of comes out of nowhere. Like, it wasn't alluded to or brought up prior, so him bringing him up as an example of not being strong enough to protect someone he cares about just kind of felt whatever to me. Anyway, this whole scene from the acting, the music, the visuals was just perfect and cemented Nero as an amazing character to me. I'll get into Dante and V in just a sec, but I really want to go over the minor characters for a second. This game added Nico Goldstein, Nero's business partner and the creator of the Devil Breakers. Before the game released, I really didn't have any idea as to how I would take this character, but after playing it... Good god, I love this woman so fucking much. Nico and her sassy and dorky personality is so damn funny you have no idea. She's probably the best new addition to this franchise as far as characters go. Because her almost sibling-like back and forths with Nero or her geeking out over Dante is just so damn fun. I understand the style of her writing not being everyone's cup of tea, but I just can't get enough of her. I'd like to mention this is also another subtle example at the game's amazing fan service because they call back to Nell Goldstein from the DMC1 prequel novel, who was also revealed to be her grandmother. And I guess I'll bring this up now, another addition this game goes out of its way to make is to include Morrison and a cameo from Patty Lowell, two characters who were prominent in the DMC anime. This is the only time where the game makes connections that will even go over most people's heads who only play the games. But regardless, I think it's neat that they went out of their way to tie in the events of the anime into the main canon. People like to harp on the race change for Morrison, but I promise it's not as big of a deal as they make it out to be. 
It's the same character, they just change the race. It's not that hard of a concept to grasp. On the topic of that, something I have to get off my chest about this series is that too much of its damn story isn't even properly established or contextualized in the actual games. That is another benefit of this game, however, because it sheds a better light on things that have been suggested in the games, but never really shown, like Dante and Virgil's home being attacked when they were kids. But it just really bothers me that a bulk of this series' narrative won't be found by just running through the games. Just a bit frustrating is all. Anyway, something that's also frustrating is just how little Lady and Trish do in this game. This is what I was referring to earlier when I mentioned not everything in this story being given proper amounts of dedicated time. Given how much the story attempts to pull, it makes sense as to why they do very little, but it also just gets to a point where you question why they're even here. You don't even get to see them fight anything, what the hell? Griffin was a genuine surprise to me, because basically slapping Iago from Aladdin into a Devil May Cry game wouldn't sound great on paper, but in execution, this guy's fucking hilarious. I love how everyone routinely is sick of his shit and threatens to murder him any chance they get with V seemingly being the only one who can only slightly tolerate him. Also, he has the single best line in the entire game. Have you lost your mind? There's a demon to destroy! Kill yourself later! I'll help! Dante in this game is up to his usual Dante shenanigans. He's still that crazy, cool, over-the-top, goofy motherfucker we've come to love since 3. But with a bit of a twist. Because this story is aiming to be a close to the Sons of Sparta saga, Dante here gets a little bit more attention when it comes to his character compared to 4, where he took a backseat to Nero. I've seen people be a bit mixed on Dante in this story, and I was for a while too for a bunch of reasons. Firstly, his treatment of Nero. See, folks thought that dead weight line from Dante was a little out of left field for him, and his insistence on not wanting Nero in the fight just kinda gave off the impression of Dante being unnecessarily dickish towards the guy. When I played the game for the first time, I was under the impression that Dante pulled the dead weight line just to get Nero to leave so that he wouldn't potentially die along with him. But the longer I thought about it, the more I think that if that were the case and the intention of the writers, it wasn't all that properly fleshed out. So I don't think that was the case either, but I do have a bit of a justification for Dante's behavior towards Nero as well as the other characters, that being his old brother Virgil. When I first played this game, I was a little disappointed that Dante wasn't shown to have a much stronger reaction to his brother supposedly being alive, despite killing him twice and shown to be very emotionally affected by it each time. But it's shown with how he treats Nero and even those like Trish and his steadfast drive to finish all of this off with Virgil, to where I kinda get what they were going for. Dante not being as emotionally intelligent towards Nero like he was in the prior game, and leaving a tired Trish in the care of V just cemented that he is just dead centered on stopping his brother's bullshit. Which to me, in a subtle way, circles back around to the lesson he learned in 3, about needing to pick up and clean up his family's mess. And when I started thinking of it like that, I couldn't help but appreciate Dante's story in this just a bit more. Not to mention, he shows incredible growth by accepting the gift his father gave him after years of shunning his demon side and further unleashes the devil from within. It's all just some really cool stuff, honestly. And it's also beautifully ironic how in order to unleash this power with the Rebellion and the Sparta, he needed to stab himself. Dante's story in this isn't as groundbreaking as Nero's, I feel, but it's still pretty damn interesting. Now on to V. I feel like I can't talk about V properly without talking about Virgil as a whole, but I'll hold off for a second. V as a character is definitely intriguing. The mystery surrounding his role in the whole story does keep your attention. Even though any longtime fan could spot the connection between him and Virgil, even if, like me, they couldn't piece together that he's literally Virgil's human half. Just everything about V is so interesting to me, and it's just even more so with the knowledge that this is Virgil's human half aiming to right his past and current wrongs, which is so cool to me. Alright, fuck it, let's talk about Virgil. I love how this story basically serves as a giant Virgil character study. With the story putting a bigger focus on his abandonment issues and how that transformed into a never-ending lust for power. I love that for Devil May Cry's big return, they put everyone's favorite power-hungry demon right at the center of it all. Again, I love how a portion of his development shines through V, ultimately. If there's a problem I have, it'd be that his redemption, if you can even call it that, feels a bit rushed. That's another thing I mentioned earlier about being rushed, cause yeah, after this gigantic bout with Dante and Nero, Virgil just decides to chill the hell out and help stop the Clyphaw from growing any further. Again, you can kinda attribute some of this development from V, but it also just feels like everyone is all buddy-buddy like this nigga Virgil didn't kill an entire city full of humans. 
Anyway, it's cool as hell to have Virgil back in this game, even though he technically wasn't on screen for very long. Something I've always loved about Virgil as a character, and I may go further into this whenever I talk about DMC3, is that his conquest for power isn't based off of some drive for, like, world domination or basic shit like that. It's always just been about never being put in a position like he was when his family was attacked when he and Dante were kids. And it's always been his way of going to claim that power, which puts him at odds with his brother. I say all of this because when you contextualize all the shit Virgil pulls as just a giant over-the-top family bout, I don't know, it just makes things more interesting to me. Especially whenever his own son steps into the middle of it all. For the little amount of screen time they share, Nero and Virgil's dynamic is just oh so delightfully fucked. Yeah, Virgil severing himself from his human half was an interesting turn to say the least, and the writing made good usage of it I'd say. It doesn't have that interesting of an arc, but with how much this game goes to deconstruct this character, I can't help but love him all the same. The story puts a supposed close to the Sons of Sparta story with having Dante and Virgil sealed away in hell, and I'm kinda torn on this for a variety of reasons, first of which being that we finally got proper Virgil back after so long. Same goes with Dante, and presumably ending it with the two potentially never coming back is a little disappointing. Not to say that Nero wouldn't be a great protagonist, because all this game did was prove how great of a character he can be. But I don't know, I just can't imagine Devil May Cry without my power-hungry demon daddy, or our favorite wacky woohoo pizza man. Not to mention story-wise, it's not like there's even a surefire way they can never come back even though they try to make it seem like they can't. They have the Yamato, which is shown to be able to cut portals through reality. It isn't unlikely the two could leave the demon world whenever they please. I'm not saying I want this series to go on forever and not want it to end, but I just wish we got more, you know? Like I said, Dante literally is DMC, so imagining it without him just feels... wrong. I don't know, but if it is the last we see of these two, it's nice to see they're making up for lost time, in their own unique way. The characters and character writing in this story is absolutely incredible. Not everyone is handled perfectly, but the journeys these characters go through, the amazingly fun character interactions, it's all just so much fun. The voice acting is also spectacular. Since 3, the voice acting for this series has been absolutely superb. Ruben Langdon has long cemented himself as the definitive Dante. And after years of being away, he just slips back into the role with such ease. I don't know if this was intentional, maybe it was, or maybe it's just been a while since Langdon voiced the character. But the direction to give Dante a more older and jaded voice worked out greatly in my opinion. <laughs> oh, brother. You cut off your own son's arm for more power, and you still lost. <laughs> Guess I get to see it with my own eyes. If it really is you. What are you muttering? <laughs> Over the years, I've been stabbed and jabbed by a number of things. But who would have ever guessed? Same goes with Dan Southworth as Virgil. Needless to say, he's just fucking phenomenal. That day, if our positions were switched, would our fates be different? Would I have your life and you mine? Let's settle this. Dante. Johnny Young Bosch killed it again as Nero. He was already pretty good in 4, but I feel like Nero's meh writing didn't allow for him to really flex his talents. He fits amazingly with the charismatic likes of Langdon and Southworth, and the emotion is just brilliantly executed. I couldn't protect Kratos to this day. I hate myself for not having enough strength. But this time is different. I swear! I'm not letting you die!
The VAs for Lady and Trish, Kate Higgins and Wendy Lee, while they were minimal, did a pretty decent job. These two characters have had a variety of English voices in this series respectively, and I can confidently say that not one of them sucked, which is cool. Faye Kingsley just did an absolutely perfect job at bringing Nico to life. She just does a phenomenal job as the dorky yet cocky smartass character type, and I can't get enough of her. Yeah, he's a real pro at smacking demons around. That's why I built him that well-functioning arm, <laughs> to kick demon ass. Hey, you got any more questions? Better ask it now. I can't read minds. Ooh, well, yeah. The same can be said for Brian Hanford as V. The slow, methodical, and mysterious demeanor just oozes with intrigue. He has a weird sense of charm that you can't help but find alluring with each line. It's really good. I curse my stars in bit of grief and woe. That made my love so high and me so low. He who desires but act not breeds pestilence. So it is written. So, what's your name? I have no name. I am but two days old. Just kidding. You can call me V. Overall, Devil May Cry 5 is just a phenomenal game. With breathtaking visuals, kick-ass music, really addicting gameplay that naturally encourages and rewards the player for getting better and improving their skills, provides three unique playable characters, all with fun and interesting gameplay styles, that while not perfect, still guarantees for a well-rounded and fun experience. I figured now was the best time to say this, but upon my most recent playthrough of the game, I found Son of Sparta to be the most ideal difficulty to play on. I just find it more engaging and interesting in that it's not a cakewalk to get those sweet S ranks, and is a true test of skill before you get into the other, crazier difficulties. Like I said, the gameplay is just phenomenal. The overall story as well for this game is just great. The writing and pacing may get a bit wonky near the end, but the entire narrative just oozes with personality. With a tone that's both delightfully fun and cheeky, as well as intense and heartfelt, characters that all have addicting and fun personalities, along with some of the best character writing and progression the series has to offer. And while I never properly mentioned it, the presentation of it all is cool as well. With William Blake poetry being a recurring motif with characters like V and Virgil, and passages routinely being used throughout the game, just gives this story its own unique identity. All while seemingly putting a close to an absolutely brilliant saga of games and storytelling, Devil May Cry 5, five years later, is unironically for me, a near-perfect video game. Now if you thought I was going to end off this video without talking about everyone's favorite power-hungry demon daddy, you are sorely mistaken. A whole year after the main game's release, we were blessed with Devil May Cry 5 Special Edition, an enhanced version of the game that adapts and makes better usage of the PlayStation 5 hardware. With stuff like fast load times, ray tracing, and the game's main seller, a playable Virgil. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie to any of y'all, I did not buy the Special Edition. Why would I go out of my way to pay for a game I already own with very few new editions that I don't even care about? Especially when the main selling point of it being the one new playable character is nothing more than a measly $5 to $6 add-on to the original game. That, and when this originally came out, I didn't have a PS5 yet, so there's that. Anyway, with the addition of Virgil comes its own Virgil story campaign, which, like the previous special editions in the series, is basically the main game but with a few new cutscenes to show Virgil doing some cool shit. Nothing about the campaign is really worth noting, but the pre-rendered CG cutscenes just looked kinda... weird. Something about the lighting and the facial animations just looks... off, I don't really know why. We as well get extended interactions between him and Dante while in the demon world, but, and this may be me nitpicking, is it just me or did they write him to be a bit more aggressive than they did in the main game? In the end of the game he could calmly chop it up with Dante and there'd be little hostility. In the new campaign he's back to being distant and aggressive. It's not a major issue, but it just felt like a weird change. Anyway, let's get into the gameplay. 
In regards to how he plays in comparison to the previous games, Virgil plays almost the same as we expect from the previous installments, which upon playing for the first time, was as much of a relief as it was an annoyance for me. What I mean when I say that is that it mainly has to do with the fact that for three straight games, Virgil has seen little to no change in moveset or arsenal, and I think that's kinda lame. We of course have his trademark Yamato, the Beowulf Gauntlets, and since at this point in time the Force Edge is a part of the Sparta, and now the Devil Sword Dante, he uses one of his summon swords, or <laughs> I'm sorry, Mirage Blades. I don't know why I'm being cheeky, that's actually a really cool name. As a replacement, which is the exact same loadout as the previous two games. Along with his gun adjacent move, the Mirage Blades. I don't know, I just wish we got a deeper loadout for Virgil this time around. Actually, hold up. I'm gonna hijack this video really quickly because I can't help but get this off my mind. What is something that these guys could have done that could have added more to Virgil's moveset in combat? I'm saying this because if by the sweet grace of God we are blessed with another DMC game where Virgil is playable, I'd like to see some stuff like this added in to make things more interesting. Firstly, I just think it'd be cool if Virgil had powers that reflected his time as both Urizen and V, respectively. What I mean when I say that is just more moves or techniques that reflect both sides of himself. For example, what if, like V, you could control up to one or maybe two demons to fight for or alongside you, just like with V and the familiars? The reason this idea in particular came to mind is because I know the DLC for the DMC reboot ended with Virgil, like, leading an army of demons or some shit, and I just thought that'd be cool for you to do in-game. And if you're at all wondering how this could potentially work out mechanically, just think of how Virgil operated in the final Arkham fight in DMC3. Something like that I feel could just be really cool. That, and I'm gonna need you guys to stick with me for this next one, Tendrils. You know those tendrils that come out and attack you during that Urizen boss with Nero? Well, why not give Virgil something similar? Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, this idea popped into my head when thinking of Alistair from Has Been Hotel, and how he has these tendrils that can almost easily cut and tear through damn near anything. Giving Virgil something similar like that would be pretty neat. I don't have an idea as to how this could work mechanically, I just think it'd be pretty cool to have. And maybe an additional style would be cool. Hideaki Itsuno, the director of this game, is shown to be quite fond of the DMC reboot. That much is obvious with stuff like the style ranking system and Virgil's Devil Trigger basically just being an elevated doppelganger style, which is pulled directly from that game. Well, why not give an additional style to spice things up? We know the Gurian or Jurian, fuck, I, I have no idea how to pronounce that. Whatever. The Gurian horse is a prominent race in the DMC world, so why not have Virgil obtain the Quicksilver style alongside his doppelganger-like Devil Trigger? Sorry, I just couldn't help but get all this stuff off my chest, as I think it'd be pretty neat to see, and just wish they did something similar for Virgil in this game. Alright, now back to the video. Virgil's playstyle, while nearly identical to the previous games, has gotten a few tweaks. Almost similarly to V, you're incentivized to make slow, meticulous movements during combat encounters, as well as precise and well thought out attacks to build up this meter above your health. The more the meter builds up, the more damage you put out, and the more stylish moves you can execute. I fucking adore this style of play for Virgil, because when mastered, you can really feel the power this character withholds, and you just look sick as hell pulling off some of these moves. The combos can feel a tad limiting, at least for me, because of the small pool of weapons you have, but nonetheless, it still kicks ass. Playing as Virgil has never felt more satisfying. This is the character to play in order to really test your skills for the game. Like I mentioned before, Virgil's Devil Trigger is basically DMC3's doppelganger style. With various settings that can either have the doppelganger pull off simultaneous movements as yours, one that lags significantly behind which allows for more breathing room between attacks, and one that only lags slightly, which is basically the normal setting. Not gonna lie, I haven't found much use for the slower setting, I just don't get much out of it personally, but the other two? Oh fuck yeah, those rock. He also has his own Sin Devil Trigger, which operates as a regular Devil Trigger, unlike the powerhouse Dante's is. And in it, of course, the combos and attacks you can pull off become more powerful and more intense. I also have to mention, Virgil's battle theme, Bury the Light, is just so fucking good. If there's any problem I have with the song itself, it's that it's a heaping nine goddamn minutes. But even then, it's not a massive problem, because the final boss with Dante provides a shorter version. 
But regardless, this song is just absolutely phenomenal and really fits the raw power of Virgil as a character. The simple addition of a playable Virgil turned this already near-perfect game to an even more nearly perfect game. Because again, it still ain't perfect perfect, you know? But for real, two nearly perfect gameplay styles, one that's simpler in comparison but still pretty fun, and one experimental gameplay style that needed a few more tweaks, but ultimately is a pretty fun time. God, I love this game so fucking much. Anyway, with all that said... If you agree or disagree with anything I've said in this video, let me know right down there in the comments below. Also, be sure to like and subscribe. This is Darion of GMB Productions, and take care.